I want to welcome you. We're glad we're, we're, uh, we're able to do this. And our desire here is to really help you. Um, you come to a conference because you probably got a question. You probably got an issue. You want to know what's, what somebody else may think or say about particular issues related to worship leadership, worship planning, and, uh, and your own hearts as you minister uh, in corporate worship at your local church. So um, I stand here as a practitioner. Um, I currently serve as, a South, as the campus pastor of our South Campus. I plan and lead weekly worship, and for the last eight years I've served as a faculty member of Bethlehem College and Seminary. Uh, I do travel abroad and get the opportunity to teach in Southeast Asia in Myanmar, and it's exciting for me to do that. I have a wife who was my accompanist in college. I married her, it's the best thing that ever happened to me, and we've been together making music ever since then. I have four children who love Jesus, and I'm an avid dog lover. My topic is the heart and role of the worship leader. And after 35 years of leading worship, you would think that I would have this all figured out. The Church of Jesus Christ is dynamic. And by being dynamic, therefore, it means it's always changing. Its forms and roles for leaders have, have and will continue to change. When I began my journey as a worship leader, as a senior at Wheaton College, I was standing next to Cliff Barrows and the team of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Crusade Association at the dedication of the Billy Graham Center. I was in awe at the dynamic personalities of Cliff Barrows, the gregarious song leader and mass choir director, Bev Shea, the passionate, soft-spoken, deep bass voice who sang every time there was a crusade. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. And that became one of the signature testifying songs of God's saving and amazing grace. I began my worship leading at the zenith of the crusade area where on Sunday morning worship services were all focused on providing opportunities for people to respond to faith in Jesus Christ or turn from sin and worldliness, repent, or rededicate your life to Jesus Christ. The often maligned altar call was the pinnacle of Sunday morning worship. The congregation sang gospel hymns of the 18th, 19th, and 20th century led by song leaders and an organist and a pianist. Choirs would sing the latest crusade anthem arrangements, or do those things called cantatas. Special music was the high point of the service prior to the message, and I realized that, that there are some here that literally missed this era of worship completely. And the only point I say for bringing that up is simply, I hope it will give you some perspective on thinking, on the thinking and values of previous generations' understanding of worship and their experiences. But in the 70s and 80s, the worship renewal movement began on the West Coast with leaders like Chuck Smith and John Wimber, and it began to sweep across the evangelical church. To hymns, we had to add choruses, often called praise and worship music, which always messed me up because I thought that's what we were doing already, praising and worship. I don't understand Soon choirs and organs were re replaced with guitars and drums and keyboards and singers on mics. And these new songs were coming so fast that soon we had to add chorus books in the pews alongside the hymnals. Do you remember the red book, the green book, the purple book from Maranatha, Hosanna Integrity, and others? These new songs were being written by New composers, a guy named Bill Gaither, Keith Green, and countless others. New artists were flooding the Christian bookstores, and there were concerts across the country. I remember churches had gospel concerts or Christian music concerts all over the place, and, and that thing called coffee houses. The dynamic nature of these spirit-filled songs and the artists that sang them often became synonymous with worship at that point in time. 
This music was fresh. It was written and played in the contemporary pop music styles, and in instruments were the, quote, lingua franca of the day. Soon this music was coming so fast that we wanted to sing the latest song in our corporate worship services, so we put up video screens in our sanctuaries so that we could display the words. This new music became the voice of our youth culture. Organs and pianos could not reproduce guitar and drum rhythms and were bound by the written page of music and therefore were not conducive to the new folk style of music. At that point, I, as a worship leader, was supposed to be able to play the guitar or the keyboard, lead a rhythm section, and sing and conduct a choir in four-part harmony, blend old and new music in the perfect spirit-led flow of music that would inspire young and old in church to meet God in euphoric praise. The story does not end here. Soon all the new music arrived with music videos and with this emerged technology. So now I'm supposed to understand sound systems, video screens, rear and front projection, audio loops and songs, special lights, and the ultimate in the powerful worship experience of the Shekinah Glory fog machines. <laughs> we needed to have sound control over every aspect of music and technology. So sanctuaries became black boxes along with drum cages, floor wedges, in-ear monitors. The new music used technology to create an incredible uh, sonic effect, cymbal washes, electronic guitar pedals to imitate every conceivable instrument possible. Songs were written and published by groups like Hill Songs, Passion, Vertical Church, All Sons and Daughters, Bethel, and even older names like Redmond, Michael W. Smith, Chris Tomlin, and even later Stonehill and Norman. Songs would go on for five to seven minutes with extended bridges to give opportunities for the congregation to close their eyes and enter into a spirit-filled season of worship. In the midst of all of this change, as a leader of 35 years, I approached my sixth decade. I cannot even figure out what I'm supposed to wear when I lead worship. I can't, coat and tie, jeans and hoodie, Button-down shirt and khakis, sweater vests, skinny jeans, the flannel shirt, the dark rim glasses. I, I am in a dilemma every Sunday morning because I minister to a wide group of people. And I want them to all feel engaged in a part of this. But, uh, but when I stand up there with silver hair, I'm trying to figure out just how can I relate? How can I serve this people? So the question I'm continually asking is, what is the role of the worship leader? Or maybe the better question is, who is a worship leader? Recently, my colleague and dear friend, Matthew, who graciously introduced us and is hosting today, were musing about different people we know who are in various worship leaderships across the country, and they're very diverse gifts and methods of leading worship. So in our discussion, we came up with some, with some sort of typology here. And, and we started off, we said, well, there are some dynamic worship leaders that are kind of the worship artist, songwriter type. They're really focusing on, they spend time writing and recording and they put a lot of emphasis on getting new music out there. They love to perform. They're always got a CD to sell and they love to tour. Maybe that's you today. There's another group of people that we, that we were musing about and that's the music educator, equipper type people, okay? You love to primarily work with groups and ensembles, adults to children, bands, orchestras, and you love seeing others engaged in the worship leading process. Or there are some of the, what I would call just the general church planter types that love to grab the guitar, stand up and lead small groups, want to be on mission in your church and community. 
and love just gathering a group of people together to worship? Or are you one of those ethnodoxologists? You're into cross-cultural music. You love to think about and see the church of Jesus Christ reflect Revelation 4 and 5, this side of glory. You love to sing in other languages, wear clothing from different parts of the world, and, uh, and, and long to meet other people that are different than you. So where are you in your worship leadership journey? Where are you in these broad general categories? How many here would identify themselves as a worship leader, songwriter? Come on. Good. How many of you uh, think, I'm, I think music education, I want to mobilize the next generation, I work with groups and ensembles. Anybody? Anybody? Oh, yeah. Okay. Good. Good, good. How many are love to just grab that guitar, get a group of people together, and we're in the middle of planting the church? Anybody here? Good. Anybody an ethnodoxologist? Great. Well, at some point in time, I've been all of those, and, some, and from time to time, I'm called upon to be all of those, but I love the tribe. And we, Matthew and I talk about there are so many parts of the tribe of worship leaders these days that... Um, Sometimes trying to figure out who I am and be at peace with that. I don't necessarily have to be the artist songwriter all the time. I can be the, the equipper and leader. So the question then might be, where are you in your current worship leadership context? Are you paid or are you volunteer? Are you full-time, part-time? Do you connect with the pastor, or is he doing his thing and you're doing your thing? I guess at this point in time, I probably should give a little bit of a definition of what I think of when I think about being a worship leader. And I tend to differentiate these two terms. A worship leader is more of a generic term that defines what the person is doing. Namely, leading corporate worship or being a part of a leadership team that is leading worship. This could be anyone that meets a prescribed set of criteria specified by a particular church. It really is diaconal in nature. You are there using your gifts and abilities to serve the body. Sometimes we call that, this is the traditional worship guy. He is up there and he's there in primarily, he or she are up there really because of their giftings in, in music. The other term I use is worship pastor. And a worship pastor is, is an office or a title or a role that was given by the church to one who has demonstrated elder-qualified life, possesses the appropriate musical and theological training to fulfill the role of pastor-shepherd. So in other words, the primary function is to shepherd the congregation doxologically. Your goal is to care for corporate worship and the people that God brings to your church. Just by way of note, if you're looking for what I think is a, a really good spiritual, uh, bathed in, in the first and second Timothy, there is uh, on the Gospel Coalition website a wonderful job description for a worship pastor. I commend it to you. I want to be clear. A worship leader does function in a pastoral role as they lead the congregation in worship and thereby need to think and lead pastorally. So in other words, you may be in your church leading worship and you're not called a worship pastor. I'm a worship leader. I'm a worship guy. But the reality is that when you step into that role in the church of Jesus Christ, in that local congregation, you are stepping into a pastoral role. You are functioning in a pastoral role. 
My friend Bob Coughlin gives probably one of my favorite definitions for worship. I wish they had the book. It's in the book Worship Matters. It goes like this. I commend it to you. A faithful worship leader magnifies the greatness of God in Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit by skillfully combining God's word and music, thereby motivating the gathered church to proclaim the gospel, to cherish God's presence, and to live for God's glory. I cannot be more succinct than what my brother Bob has done, so commend that to you. Because it gets the pastor's heart in there. It really comes across. Whatever your title that you have or whatever your church uses, uh, that captures the pastor's heart. So when I'm thinking about at Bethlehem, we are, we are presently, uh, I spend part of my time training worship leaders. So when I sit down with our local church, our pastoral staff and elders, there are some competencies that I feel like I'm called upon to demonstrate, model, and understand. And so I commend, there are eight of them to you, things to think about in your worship leadership. Number one, you need to be a worshiper yourself. You need to be a worshiper yourself. You must know God and spend time with him daily. A leader needs to be able to distinguish the voice of God, experience the presence of God. They cannot be second-handers if they're going to lead people into the presence of God. You must know God. You need to practice the language of prayer and song in your own personal worship. We really do give our people a language of praise with our words and the way in which we connect scripture and song together. We give them a language of praise. And so if we're not praying scripture, if we're not spending our time, then we're going to be up there uh, fumbling for words to say that help us set up songs or help us move through transitions And if we have not been engaged in the presence of God, um, we become second-handers. We need to pursue godly character and be above reproach. So, number one, we need to be a worshiper ourselves. Number two, we need to be biblical. We need to be biblical. Worship leaders are called to lead God's people biblically. It's important to know who God is through his word and how he works. We give our people that language of praise through the use of the word. Scripture memory and the study of his word is vitally important. I don't know how many times in that moment the word of God comes to my my mind as I'm thinking about transitioning or what needs to be said, spirit feels like I need to stop in this moment and have something to say. Oftentimes what God brings to mind is a text. And what I'm very confident in is that my words will pass away, but God's words will never pass away. His spirit moves through his word. So giving our people a language in which we praise. Obviously, the Psalms are our songbook. The Psalms provide that breadth of life and experience and emotion that minister to the realities of people in their lives. Suffering, loss, pain, hope, and joy, all of them make up the emotional backdrop of our corporate worship. On any given time, there's people who have just found out they have cancer, And there are people there that feel like I'm on the top of the world because God answered my prayer. They're hungry to learn. They're broken and in the midst of pain and and loss. That's our job when we lead our people into corporate worship. We need to be biblical. Three, we need to be liturgists. 
We need to be liturgists. We need to know how to corporate, plan corporate worship. There is a structure and a flow to biblical worship. It begins with God revealing himself to us and we respond. We talk about a rhythm called revelation and response. We need to understand that apart from God revealing himself to us, we are incapable of responding in faith and worship. God shows himself to us and we respond. And obviously Isaiah 6 and the pattern of the vision that God made available to Isaiah is a wonderful model for that. But when we think about the week in and week out worship planning, what do we do each week? Is it the same? Is it different? Is it completely creating something new every week? I would go nuts if I had to do that. There's too many things to do. I don't have enough time in the whole scheme of things. I have come to love a liturgy. And obviously, uh, I commend Brian Chappell's book, uh, Christ-Centered Worship, to you where he lays out a general gospel flow of worship. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, the word in response. I got to start somewhere every week. And those structural hooks for me to place new songs, new prayers, different ensembles, different seasonal things, all of those things help me as I sit down and, uh, and shepherd a people week in and week out through corporate worship. So I have to figure out how that goes. And I think one of the things that I find so often when, when I'm out and doing some clinic work and teaching in, in churches on worship, I sit through a worship experience and I realize they've not thought how God speaks to us and how we respond. And then it becomes very willy-nilly and arbitrary and people feel like it's whatever the worship leader wants to do. That seems to be what, what's going on here. And um, I think we need to teach our people a gospel flow in our corporate worship. God reveals himself to us and we respond. And there are many cycles of that that go through our corporate experiences. We need to be a liturgist. Number four, we need to be artists. We need to be musicians. We're going to hear about that later. We need to keep learning new music. We need to keep making music. We need to stay fresh as musicians. Music is, is such a large tool in our worship. We need to be fresh. How many of you get new music through some subscription thing that you subscribe to and you get, they send you. How many jump on YouTube and follow groups? How many of you have all sorts of people in your church telling, man, we got to do this song, we got to do this song? How many got that? Okay, yeah, all right. So there are times when I just sit down and go, okay, I got to follow that one. I'll jump on YouTube, grab that one. Uh, oh, gee, that's not so good. Okay, well. <laughs> I have to talk to them later why I didn't use that song. Or, you know, all of those kinds of pastoral things. But um, how many of you are using uh, your, your songs that you're writing in your churches? Please keep doing that. Please keep doing that. Um, sadly enough, I, I've, over the years, there are times when less than 40 people across uh, the world are determining what, all, what songs the Christian church are singing. That's not enough. Forty people cannot contain all of the pictures of God, the character of God, and the creativity of God in those kinds of, of settings. We need fresh expressions. But if we're going to do that, musicians, artists, we need to encourage that, and we need to provide time for that. Number five, be educators. Always be about reproducing. Always be equippers, trainers, and teachers. You need to always be reproducing yourself and someone around you. You need to always do that. 
Paul always had a Timothy. <laughs> There's always somebody there. And uh, I can't tell you uh, how much um, joy there is in seeing somebody catch a glimpse of some of the things that you've seen and come alongside you. Mentoring is vital in this day and age. Leaders need direction. So often, people are afraid to step out simply because they don't see any models. Nobody's encouraging them. Um, that tends to be sort of my warp and woof these days as not only do I, do I teach, but I've always got one or two folks working with me, and I have the joy of stepping aside often and sitting down and watching them lead and then to just wrestle with how did that go? What did you learn? What went right? But even, even for all of you, there's, there's going to be a Sunday when you're sick, okay? And who's going to take over for you? Who's going to be able to step into that role and help lead the people? We've always got to be thinking how are we reproducing ourselves? How are we training? How are we teaching? The other thing is we need, we need to teach music. Music illiteracy is, it comes as quickly as one generation. Music illiteracy. You can't always assume that that vocalist can harmonize without some sort of choir singing experience where they learned how to do that. More and more, I have vocalists I, that, that can't harmonize. I can, I, I can only have one person, female vocalist on lead, okay? So, oh Lord, the deer in the headlight look when I learn, turn over and say, can you find an alto part on that? Uh, mm, well, I'll take it home and work on it. And then Sunday morning, they're scared to death, so they don't even do what they practice to do. They default. We all love that person who can harmonize. We all, they're invaluable to our ministries. So how did they get that? We need to explore that. We need to always be thinking, music competency comes with music training in various shapes and forms. I'm not saying if you don't read notes, you're not a musician, but you've got to have experiences where you're learning uh, how to make music and how to listen. Instrumentalists, you know, unless you are playing a lot, you're not going to get better. That one hour a week in church is not going to do it for you, okay? You're going to go on YouTube and you're going to get those Shane and Shane um, worship tracks on how to play the bass. That's great. But until you, it becomes you and internalize that, um, you're not going to grow. Play, play. Encourage people to play. Play outside of church. Those instrumentalists then can bring that experience into the worship context and, and uh, can bless the whole process. Number six, shepherd. Care for your congregation and your ministry team. Know your sheep. A pastor knows his sheep. Know your sheep. Know your team. Know your choir. Know your ensemble. Know them personally. Know their families. Pray for them. Know what their heart languages are in worship. Shepherd our song selections. We shepherd people personally, and we need to shepherd the food that they are getting. We need song selection with good theology, correct pictures of God, and truth that will feed our sheep when they're thriving and when they're hurting. We as shepherds need to know how to shepherd people through sinful behavior and wrong motives in worship. We often need to confess our own sinful motives and attitudes, and we need to be able to 
confront others with sin in their hearts and attitudes. And this is hard work. This is where the rubber meets the road between a worship guy and somebody who's pastoring these people. Because how am I going to step in and say, I don't like what I see in your life. Your words in this context are hurtful. Um, I'm just not sensing that you're growing in grace and, and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. This seems to be all about you. This isn't about the Lord. How do I step back and speak into those sinful behaviors? And, and you're all sitting there right now going, I can think of that one of those. Because it's very real. Uh, obviously, pride is huge. When we have people who are making music and up in front, oftentimes. Um, and I spend a ton of my time one-on-one -on -one shepherding people's hearts in this whole sense of worship leadership. I have to be able to know how to confront. I have to be transparent and, guys, I've sinned. My words here were not helpful. I came across really sharp, harsh. It's not what I want to do. Please forgive me. You're developing that transparency and that authenticity with your people. It's huge. Number seven, culture learners. We need to be culture learners for the sake of the neighborhoods and nations. We always need to be knowing our congregation, be able to learn what, what their culture is about, what musics they listen to, foods, customs. The demographics of our neighborhoods and communities are changing. We are synthesizing more and more people here in America. Anymore, we're gonna be asking the question, what is majority culture? Depending upon what you, what research you look at, 2025, 2032, 2045, I guess 2025 is the one I've heard of late, that said there will be no majority culture in America by 2025. Okay, so if we've not figured out how to cross cultures and learn about people that are different than us, we're going to find ourselves very isolated. Very isolated. And uh, obviously, we ought to spend a little time talking about that on a d day like today. This is an anniversary that we at Bethlehem spend time every year on MLK Day. And uh, we have uh, just heard a sermon yesterday from our pastor calling us into account for being part of the problem of structural racism. And we as worship leaders deal in culture we deal oftentimes in the things that um, people connect into. So I can remember at Bethlehem, the first Sunday, I bought a B3. We were called to be gospel. We're in an urban neighborhood, and I bought that B3. I got a brother to come, and uh, to this day, he has become my closest brother in Christ. And uh, we started in on racial harmony, ethnic harmony. And that, as um, many writers have said, is a mighty long journey. But I don't know about you. I grew up in South Central Iowa. Uh, there, you know, the, the diversity was Dutch or German. Okay, that, that was the diversity, Dutch or German. Okay, so then when I, when I went to Chicago, that got my world way open. And, uh, and so now um, I am one of those ethnodoxologists, proudly, unashamedly, um, because I value crossing cultures. I value looking not to my own interest, but the interest of others. I value what God is doing across our world and across our country. And um, my mother lives in Pella, Iowa, okay? We go down there, that's 
Dutch, one of the Dutch Meccas. And it's interesting to watch that community respond to diversity. And um, obviously, the first thing they're going to look at you if your church moves in this direction is music. Okay? So how do I do that? I haven't got anybody that can even know how to turn on a Hammond. Okay, so how, how does that work? And then I went through, the, I went through the, the white shock of saying, how come, Chuck, how come you're doing that? You're not black. Yeah, but guess what? There are three families over there, and I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, I am learning to speak their heart language, and they feel all of a sudden honored because I would try to do that. But Chuck, you didn't do that gospel music very well. I know. <laughs> I get it. You didn't grow up in a Dutch community in rural Iowa and have the neck thing going and the, and the little thing, two-step going back and forth this way. But God led us into a transracial adoption from a little girl from Columbus, Georgia. And God brought into my life all sorts of um, friends that uh, came alongside me and helped me understand what it was to think about culture in a different way. I still wrestle with the, the idea, and I have to continually help our people understand even the concept of holiness. I, I brought this up at, a, at our congregational panel on Saturday night. I grew up, and where we expressed holiness was Isaiah 6 and the Hebrew hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. And it was reflective, somber, high, and holy. And then my brothers came along and told me that holiness was, I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. And when they started doing that during our quiet um, Communion time, I was freaking out. Boy, I'm going to get notes on this one. But God awakened my heart and showed me that there are way more expressions of God's holiness than that Hebrew hymn, holy, 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 from my Western European background. We need to be culture learners. And there are people out there that can help us but God's bringing people into your congregation that you maybe have not even seen yet, but they're there, that they have different heart languages than you. Look to them. Listen to them. Call upon them. Let them help you. I didn't speak Spanish, but I got a lot of Spanish-speaking people around that can help me speak Spanish. I can do that. You can do that. I think God's going to be calling us to be cultural learners in the 21st century. The, the, the great reality is when peoples from various tribes and cultures can come together under the banner of Jesus Christ and live in unity and love one another, that's the thing the world can't reproduce. They can niche market everything else. We can simply say we're better separate than together. You can do contemporary, traditional, blended, uh, black church, Hispanic church, Asian church, all of those kinds of things, you know, all of those kinds of things. But when that group comes together, that is the testimony to the world that Jesus Christ is the great um, barrier breaker, the great reconciler who breaks down the walls of hostility. So I want to challenge you that we're going to hear that later, and I don't want to get going. I'm starting to preach. Lastly, I need to be a leader. And I need to help lead our people in change. Times change, people change, culture change, changes. I'm thankful that the word never changes. If faith is growing and changing, and our people are continually growing in grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, then it stands to reason that since we work with cultural expressions and different people, then change is inevitable. I could be called the pastor of change. Pastor for change. 
How many of you have run into issues in your church when we tried to change things? It's virtually the nature of pastoring. How do we shepherd people through change? We must lead our people. That's what leadership is. We must spend time building relationships with our people. They need to trust us. We need to trust them as we work through change. If there isn't a relational foundation for that, change will be very hard. And sometimes we can find ourselves out of a ministry position because we didn't manage change well. So I want to encourage you. We need to be listeners. We need humility. And we need to prophetically move forward towards change that would be pleasing to God and helpful to the congregation. Philippians 2, probably one of my favorite passages for worship leaders and worship pastors. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and one of mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others, and have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Spiritual leadership is about humility before God, and always crying out to him in desperation, Lord, unless you show up, I can't do this. This is an impossible task because you can't change hearts. God does that. But we're called to be faithful and we want to be effective in what God has given us to do. So, simply words of wisdom to think about from somebody who started this a few years ago. I feel like some days I start to give the father talks to the church and to the younger generation. But um, seek the Lord and be a learner of so many different things. Got, we done, got one question. I'll be around afterwards if you have any questions. Look forward to hearing for the rest of the speakers. I'm excited about what God's going to be doing today as we gather. So thank you.